a warm welcome from my side to the performance tricks that I learned from contributing to the Azure.net SDK. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can reach out to me at, at Daniel Marbach, or if you have any questions that I'm not able to answer during the comments in the YouTube channel, um, you can also reach out to me at on email via daniel.marbach at particular.net. So I'm a practical learner and I need to do things hands-on and I found the Azure SDK repository the perfect spot to learn and apply interesting performance optimization techniques. And over the years, I've been contributing more than 70 pull requests to the Azure.NET SDK repository. And in this talk, I'm going to summarize some of the key learnings of my adventures into the Azure SDK repository so that you can have a head start should you wish to start applying performance optimization techniques in your code bases as well. I have to give you a word of warning though, because sometimes when I do these types of performance optimizations, I hear from my colleagues and friends as like, wow, that's crazy. Is the complexity of this change really worth it? Isn't that premature optimization, Daniel? And I must say some of these optimizations that I'm showing here today are sometimes called out as sort of esoteric. Uh, and please don't jump to conclusions and apply them blindly everywhere in your code bases. Because what really matters is whether, this, whether the code that you're trying to apply these optimizations to is executed under scale. So what it means is that if you apply these optimizations and code is executed under scale, usually what you can do is you can make the code more efficient in terms of resource usage, execution time, throughput, and memory usage. But performance improvements, once you start applying them and measuring things and doing it more and more, they can be highly addictive. But it's important to understand that nobody really likes to optimize code that is fast enough or only executed once a day, right? So again, think about whether is this the code that you're looking at, is it executed under scale? Try to pay close attention to things that are instantiated, parsed, processed per request? Is it hundreds, hundreds of requests per second, thousands of requests per second? And then think about how the assumptions of the people that wrote this code actually affect the performance characteristics. And that's mainly the memory, the throughput, and stuff like that at scale. And only then start applying these optimization techniques that I'm showing you here today. And then I promise you won't be called out as a premature optimizer at all. So the first rule that I learned from applying these performance optimization techniques falls into the category of avoid excessive allocations to reduce the garbage collection overhead. And the first one is think at least twice before using link or unnecessary enumerations on the hot path. So please, please don't get me wrong. Link is great and I wouldn't want to miss it at all. Yet on the hot path, it's sometimes far too easy to get into troubles with link because it can cause hidden allocations and it's very difficult for the just-in-time compiler to optimize. I'm aware there are a lot of awesome improvements being done also to .NET 7 in terms of link, but still you should always think about whether you want to use link on the hot path and in general, I recommend not to do so. I'm going to show a piece of code that is called the MQP receiver and that's the driver behind the service bus and the event hubs .NET SDK, and by driver, I mean that's basically the communication mechanism that tells the service in the cloud whether a message is completed, it fetches messages over the TCP connection, and so forth. So here is a simplified version of the MQP receiver. And one of the things that the Azure SDK guidelines say for the people that are writing the Azure.NET SDK stuff, it says that whenever you're accepting a collection type like a list or something like that, please take the broadest enumerable, the broadest possible enumeration type. And that's usually I enumerable of string. And here we have this complete internal ASIC method that accepts an I enumerable of string called lock tokens. And lock tokens for you as a simplification, it's basically a GUID, right? And then what it does, once it accepts that enumerable, it then applies a link select statement and a two array. And then on the second, on the next line, it then checks with a link any whether it's already has seen this GUID in the concurrent back that is also a sort of state part of this MQP receiver. And now in order to see what happens under the covers is we need to decompile this code. When we decompile this code, we get this gibberish stuff that I'm showing on the screen. And when we look very close, what we can see here 
is, and I'm going to zoom in, we have this pattern of nine underscore underscore two underscore zero and some question mark stuff. And what this code actually means is that um, we are in the safe zone because what's going to happen is we have a delegate that is going to get allocated, but it's statically cached. So whenever you see this question mark, question mark, underscore, underscore equals pattern, then usually we can say we are safe and we don't have to worry about it. But then if you look on the other hand, we have this here, funk grid of pool allocation that happens every time this code is executed. And this is, this is a, a problem because when this code is executed at scale, we're creating unnecessary allocations. Can we get rid of this? Yes, we can get rid of this by simply turning the any into a for each and an if statement. So very simple refactoring. So instead of writing any, we do a for each, we look through the stuff, and then we check in an if statement whether we have already seen from the concurrent back the token GUID that we just converted. And if that's the case, we go on one code path as before, and otherwise we go on the other code path. And again, if we want to know what's happening now is we can decompile this code with our favorite tool, decompiler. And then if we zoom in, we can now see here that we have our beloved pattern of nine underscore underscore two uh, question mark, question mark, and some gibberish stuff that the compiler generated for us. Luckily, we don't have to type this type of code ourselves. And now we know we are in the safe zone. So we have a statically cached delegate. And now the question is, was this optimization actually worth it? Have we achieved something? And how can we know that? Well, we can only know um, whether we achieved something by actually benchmarking stuff. I've used benchmark.net uh, quite a lot. I'm not going to cover how you do benchmarking, how benchmark.net works, because that would be a whole, a whole another talk. But it's really important instead of just thinking about, oh, I'm sure this is going to be great because Daniel told me to do so, and then you apply this to your code path. You should also take care of actually measuring the before and after when you make these changes. Otherwise, it might be that sometimes surprise happens, and I'm going to talk about that as well. So I'm going to show you the benchmarks result when I actually did a before and after comparison. So I executed the before and after against multiple collection types, array, lists, hash sets, and lazy enumerated enumerables. And I know it's a lot of stuff on the screen. Don't be shocked. I'm going to summarize it for you. So when we look at the first line, what we can see is that just by getting rid of the any statement in this piece of code, we we're actually able to get 20 to 40% throughput improvement, that's the first line. And on the second line, we can see that we were able to essentially squeeze out 20 to 40% Gen Zero garbage collection reduction. So that's already quite amazing by just getting rid of the any statement. And then I'm asking myself, well, can we actually do more? Maybe if you remember, we had a select statement and a two array statement in the previous code, and we could totally get rid of it. And I have summarized some of the rules that I have applied when I actually want to get completely rid of link. And I call this link to collection based operations. And these are the rules. I'm presenting them on the screen. When you want to go even further, such as, for example, in the previous example, removing the select and two array statement, you can apply these rules. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to focus on one of these rules in the interest of time. So one of the key rules when you do this type of uh, link to collection based operations is you have to think about whenever you use a collection like a list that the collection has an associated capacity when you do it up and that capacity sometimes needs to grow. So when you start adding stuff to that collection and it cannot fulfill uh, the capacity anymore, then it needs to grow. And what, that ha what happens then is it's going to take some time because you, you cannot add it because you're then paying essentially the price of the collection will internally halt that add operation and then will, it will create more buckets and more capacity. It will copy stuff around and whatever. And that usually takes time and that has an impact on the throughput of your code. And that's an expensive operation that you want to avoid. So what it means is when you can, when you know how many things you're going into, uh, going to put into the collection, then you need to new up, for example, a list with a predefined count, and then it's not going to grow and then it's going to be faster. Okay, but 
Again, I have, uh, I'm not going to cover more of these things. I have a much longer version of this talk, should you be interested, that I will be sharing at the end of, uh, of this, uh, of this .NET Conf session, and then you can watch a, a more, uh, so a more, a longer version of this talk, should you be interested to hear more about these types of refactorings. And then again, the question is, did we achieve anything if we actually migrated completely away from link? And if you do a before and after comparison of a version that is no longer using link and just the version that got rid of the any, what we can see is we actually were able to squeeze out yet another five to 64% of throughput improvement and yet another 23 to 61% Gen Zero garbage collection reduction. That's amazing, isn't it? But if you look really close, what we then see is that in some types of scenarios, we are actually up to 56% slower. And when is that the case? When we are actually in the case of lazy enumerated values. So, so when we get, we're getting true enumerables that are lazy enumerated and not already materialized collections, then we're actually much, much worse. And now the question comes, is that an indication we shouldn't be doing such a refactoring? Well, the answer is it depends. If you know what is passed into uh, your code, then this might be a good optimization because if you know that only lists and arrays are already materialized collections are passed in, then this is a very good optimization. And in other cases, you should always, at least in my opinion, favor readability. That should be the key driver instead of trying to gold plate every part of the code base. And there are likely other areas in your code base that are sl slowing things down even more and you can make higher impact type of changes. So in order to know whether it's good or not, you can fire up your memory and performance profiler and get a better understanding of the code that is executed at scale. And then like with all the things, it's crucial to know when to stop on a given code path and find other areas that are more impactful to optimize. So again, the context of the piece of code that you're trying to optimize is key. And for example, with the Azure SDK, .NET SDK, the team has a lot of telemetry and knowledge about the use cases. And we knew in the specific case that we're almost always getting already materialized collections. So we're not falling into this performance uh, overhead of lazy enumerated enumerables. And therefore, this was a good optimization to make. The next rule that I want to talk about today is be aware of closure allocations. I already touched a little bit on closure allocations during the link performance investigations but closures can occur anywhere where we have lambdas, and that is action delegate, function delegates, being invoked that access state from outside the lambda. You might be thinking, Daniel, come on, what gibberish are you talking about? Let me give you a specific example. So here, probably you have already used concurrent dictionary yourself, or you have seen it being used in the wild. And this is not an example out of the Azure SDK, I took a, a simplified example because the Azure SDK example would be a little bit too complex to cover uh, in the short uh, presentation today. So when you look at this concurrent dictionary, we see here the uh, get or add method and the get or add method has a delegate where we can actually, where we get the key. And then when this delegate is invoked, what is going to happen, it's going to access state, some state and some other state that is on line one and line two in this code snippet. So we are essentially accessing state that is outside the curly, curly braces um, of, uh, of, this, of this lambda, and that means a closure is going to occur. How can we know that there is closure allocations? Well, we can decompile the code again with our favorite decompiler. And when we do that, we get some type of code that I'm showing you here on the screen. And what we can see here is we have a display class allocation and we have a function delegate allocation on line six. The display class allocation is on line one. And these two allocations, they're totally unnecessary and we can get rid of them. We can get rid of them by actually embracing a feature that was introduced in C sharp nine and it's called static lambda. With static lambdas, it makes it possible then we're Whenever we have lambdas, we can actually add the static keyword to it. And then the compiler enforces that we can only access state that, this is, that is within the curly braces of the lambda. And here we just mark that lambda with stat, uh, as static. And then we use the overload that accepts a state parameter. 
And then what we can do is um, we have no longer access to state that is outside the curly braces. So we need to pass in the state that is coming from the outside over the state variable. How do we do that? Well, in our case, I'm just using a value tuple. So I'm constructing a value tuple on line eight, and then I pass in some state and some other state as a value tuple state into that getter add method. And then inside the get, getter add method on line five, I'm deconstructing the value tuple, the state, and then I have locals that represent the state within the Lambda. And then I can just concatenate my string again, and I have no closure allocations anymore with that. Now let's have a look how we are doing. <clears throat> when we decompile this code, we can now see that we have our beloved pattern that we have already seen before. We have this nine underscore underscore zero underscore zero question mark, question mark, whatever code that the, that the compiler generates. And now we have get, get rid of this closure allocation. And then you might be, and then again, you might be thinking, is that even worth doing? Let's have a look. Again, we have to know because we just made the code slightly more complex, slightly more difficult to read and understand and maintain over the time. So is it really worth to make these types of changes? I've run the benchmark with a getter at with a closure and a getter at without a closure. And again, if we summarize this, what we can see is we are now in terms of throughput 70, 71% faster and all the allocations are gone. But how would we detect those allocations? Well, what you can do is you can use your favorite memory profiler and watch out for excessive allocations of the display class and various variants of action star and function star allocations in your favorite profiler. Or you can do a more proactive approach while you're typing the codes. There is actually for Rider, there's a heap allocation viewer and for Visual Studio, there is the heap allocation analyzer, the Rosen analyzers that helps you discover while you're typing those closure allocations so that you don't even have them in your code. And then many built-in types, they use delegates, um, that use delegates have now generic overloads that allow to pass in state into the delegate. I've shown you the getter add method and previous versions um, of the .NET framework, they had sometimes action and function delegates that accepted an object state thingy. And that's usually not really good, right? Because in the example that I made where I pass in the value tuple, that would mean the value tuple would be boxed. And then we have another allocation that we don't want to have. And with the generic overloads, we can pass in value tuples. There is no boxing. So you should always favor those types of overloads if they are available. And then you might be asking, but Daniel, come on, seriously? I mean, all this complexity, is it really worth it? Well, I work for a company called Particular Software and we are the makers of Enservice Bus. Enservice Bus is a higher level abstraction over queuing system. It provides a lot of benefits on top of what the usual drivers of queuing system don't provide. And in there, there is the pipeline execution engine, so to speak. And that's the thing that essentially executes the customer's code with all their IOC stuff and entity framework and whatever. And that piece of code needs to be highly optimized. And I went down and hunted closure allocations inside that pipeline. And when I removed all the closure allocations and measured the before and after, I could see that we're up to 74% fast, uh, 74 to 78% faster, and all the closure allocations are gone. If you want to read more about what I've done there, there is a blog on the particular blog that you can read. Um, and should you have more questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. The next one is when you're dealing with large objects or, or buffers, then you should always pull and reuse those buffers to reduce the GC overhead. And again, I'm going to come back to this uh, lock token thingy. So when stuff comes from the network, for the, from the TCP stream, from over the MQP protocol with Azure Service Bus, the lock tokens, the SCUIT, are usually in, in the, the TCP stream. They come in as array segments. And this was the code that was in there. And when we zoom closer in, what we can see is that for every lock token that came from the TCP stream, we allocated there a byte array of 16 bytes. And then we used buffer block copy to essentially uh, take 
what comes from the network and, and then turn that into a, a GUID. And if we execute this code thousands and hun uh, hundreds and thousands of times a second, this is a very costly allocation because we're going to pay the price of, of the byte array of 16 allocations all the time and potentially concurrently, depending how many things we're handling concurrently, right? So, and then I heard of this concept of the array pool. So for those who are not familiar with the array pool, it's kind of similar like a car rental. When you go to a car rental, you're saying, hey, I want to, uh, I want to rent a car that can fit three people. And then the car rental gives you a car, maybe a four-seater car, maybe they only have a six-seater car. I don't even know if there is such a car, just as an example. But you can at least fit three people into that car. And with what's also important is once you are done you, with using the car, you return it back to the car rental uh, service agency. And with array pool, it's quite similar, except you're not renting cars, you're actually renting arrays. I heard of it and I was like, oh, cool, I can just get rid of this allocation by using the array pool. And by the way, I'm not making this up. This is exactly what happened. So again, I was like, okay, let's rent 16 bytes from the array pool. And then once we are done, then return the, the stuff back to the array pool. And then again, because I'm a good citizen, I want to know whether my optimizations actually help and actually make things better. I did do some benchmarking. And when we look at what the benchmark actually turned out, we can see that uh, we have the buffer and block copy version and we have the buffer pool version. And as it turns out, what's going to happen is we saved allocations. So we got rid of all the allocations. That's the last line, but the throughput is actually much worse. We are 226% slower than the original version. And then we could say, wow, that's terrible, Daniel. But is it really terrible? Well, it really depends, right? If you are making this change in, let's say, a memory constrained, constrained environment, you might be able to say, well, I'm, I can make a trade-off between memory and throughput, so it's okay if it's a little bit slower. In some other environments, you might not be able to do that, and then this is not a good change to make. But in this specific example, we can do actually much better, and we can use the next rule. For small local buffers, consider using the stack. Well, with C Sharp 7.3 and the introduction of span of D and the stack alloc keyword, keyword in 7.3, we can directly allocate memory on the method stack, and that memory is cleared when the method returns. And that is super cool because now what we can do is we can say, well, stack alloc 16 bytes on, on the method stack. And then the garbage collector doesn't have to do anything with this because it's just going to get clear when the method returns, all right? And then we use the span-based overloads of the array segment, and then we copy the bytes that are coming from the network into that stack allocated memory, and then we can create a, a GUID. But you might be asking, but Daniel, I know I've read the MSDN documentation. There is a GUID overload that directly accepts a read-only span of bytes into the GUID constructor. Why are you even doing this? And I want to say, yes, you're absolutely right. There is this GUID constructor. First of all, the Azure.NET SDK is using the NET standard 2.0 version. And as far as I remember, that constructor is not there um, in the NET standard. Plus, what's also important is that in certain types of cases, the Azure.NET SDK with service bus and event hubs, they need to take a defensive copy because of the underlying driver has certain uh, behavior. They need to take a defensive copy of, some, uh, of something that is coming from TCP. And in such a case, this is actually uh, copying makes sense. But again, it really depends on the piece of code that you're looking at. So let's have a look how we're doing with this new stack alloc. And what we can see now is when we compare all these three versions, now we're doing super great because our throughput is now improved by 45% and all the allocations are gone. So nice. And by the way, stack alloc, be careful. Um, you can't just stack alloc allocate whatever, right? Because then you're going to run into nasty runtime problems. There is a lot of good guidance on the documentation available on the learn doc site consume it first before you stack alloc. And there is also more guidance around how much you can actually allocate is being written 
by the, the documentation teams uh, out there. There's still some de debates about it, but just be aware, don't, don't just blindly allocate on the stack without knowing what you're doing because it can lead to re nasty runtime problems. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to summarize all the rules that I've learned from the Azure Service Bus SDK investigations. I have presented them on the screen. I'm not going to cover them in, in, in all of them because it's too much. I know it's also a little bit too much right now on the screen, but I'm putting them there here as sort of a reference, sort of a cheat sheet, should you wish to take sort of a screenshot and apply those rules as well in your code bases, then you have at least all of them on one slide available for your own consumption. And let me wrap up things. At scale, implementation details matter. And also your understanding of the code base is really important. But again, don't jump to conclusions and blindly apply these types of optimizations everywhere. First of all, tweak the expensive IO bound operations first. So if your database call takes a second, then make that SQL statement or whatever, you use, whatever you're using, make it faster because that gives you orders of magnitude of more performance. And then once you have tweaked the IO bound pass first, then you can potentially start applying these optimization techniques to make your code even faster. And many times these techniques can, can be uh, combined with refactorings and redesigns on uh, the hot path. And maybe you're wondering, how did all these contributions actually improve something in the Azure Service Bus SDK? Well, we got with the contributions that I've done up to 80% increase in the overall publishing throughput performance with the latest event hub uh, releases in the SDK and around three to 4% uh, processing improvement in the SDK as well. And you get that just by upgrading to new minor versions of the Azure Service Bus SDKs, uh, mainly event hubs and service bus. So that's really cool, right? So for us as engineers, it means we have to know what to ignore and know what to pay close attention to in the code bases that we're working on. And sometimes that will mean ignoring the performance optimizations learned here in the code bases where they don't matter, yet consistently apply them where they actually do. I have here also on the slide, a link to my GitHub repository where you can read up all the things I've presented to you and even more in sort of a handout read me fashion. And I wish you a very great day at the .net conf, whether it's morning or evening or what in whatever time zone you are and feel free to reach out to me with more questions. That was great, Daniel. We've had a lot of chat on the Twitch channel. So I suggest okay. you, you go and hang out there. Uh, there are some that. great tips there. There's a lot of chat about link, alternatives to links, uh, all sorts of stuff going on. We have Fields Mabel, who's a big performance um, enthusiast. Uh, so I would say go and have a, a chat over there because there is a lot Happy of interesting so. conversations going on on the Twitch side. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and, uh, and all of this. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day planned. And uh, it's been so nice to see you again. Thank you very much for hosting me. All righty. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.